it's kind of the last meeting for this course other than your final presentations on 11th of December. <coughs> and uh, uh, the goal uh, for this, uh, uh, for today's uh, meeting is to finish, uh, uh, you know, the idea of uh, topological states, specifically ed states, and the role of spin in some of these topological insulators, and uh, uh, how, uh, um, kind of going along the paradigm of how do you design materials uh, um, that uh, <laughs> somehow, uh, based on their intrinsic material properties, are able to behave uh, as if there was an external magnetic field or something like that, except there is no such external fields. You know, so uh, that is a property of the material itself. And um, just as a uh, quick reminder, uh, and, and after we finish the discussion on the topological, uh, topologically protected transport and uh, what sort of uh, materials are expected to exhibit them and uh, what uh, sort of phenomena can you expect uh, to appear experimentally. Uh, and uh, what we'll do is uh, try to kind of, uh, my, my kind of goal after that was, would be to uh, give a very brief review of uh, the core concepts that we have covered through the semester and, uh, uh, and uh, use the, uh, in addition to the concepts, I mean use some of the assignments and all that to uh, kind of track that as well uh, and uh, maybe solve with you. Uh, if you have specific questions on some things, I can try to solve that with you here. Um, and uh, that, that's kind of the goal today. I mean, we want, don't want to, uh, um, so maybe the first uh, uh, 45 minutes or an hour, I don't know, uh, we'll finish up our earlier discussion and the rest of it will all be review and that sort of thing. So, okay, uh, and by the way, some of this new, uh, some of the, uh, not new, but you know, slides and other things I've posted. I think you got the email uh, on, on the website, and you can you should be able to download them and, uh, uh, if you need them for reference. Okay. okay, so where were we in the last class? Uh, I will very briefly recap uh, this uh, general idea. First things first, we got comfortable uh, with uh, the concept of uh, writing uh, down um, the you know, uh, given any sort of a system, for example, graphene, uh, how do we uh, get its energy uh, band structure, right? We, we uh, spent some time looking at, you know, hopping from one atom to the next, for example. That's a simple, very simple tight binding model of a Hamiltonian. And the reason we go through this process is uh, that uh, once we are able to write down the uh, uh, Hamiltonian in this form, uh, in, in it is buried all its topological properties, all its uh, uh, you know, non-trivial sort of uh, interesting berry phases, all that stuff can be, achieve, uh, can be gauged or can be uh, uh, obtained from this sort of a Hamiltonian picture. Of course, you can go uh, do a completely at atomistic image. Uh, instead of tight binding, you can do uh, you know, full-blown full, full, full uh, first principles calculations. Uh, but at, le at least the co concepts will not emerge as simply as you can see it in the tight binding model, you know, and that's the reason we are kind of getting familiar with it. And typically, even after we do a full accurate calculation of a uh, crystalline solid and we are looking at electrical transport through it, we are always interested in something that happens near the top of a valence band and the bottom of a conduction band, you know, where my Fermi level is. And in the end, as a result, there are two bands to you know kind of look at, right? And, and so this is a fact that you know it is a two by two Hamiltonian is obviously a minimal set of things, but it is also in electrical transport um, that's many times that's what you need. You know, you don't need to look at all the other faraway energy scales because we typically don't uh, in electrical transport we'll be probing these states only. You know? So that's kind of the idea. Okay, so. Okay, yeah, uh, and, and we, uh, for, for graphene, uh, what we found was we uh, wrote down this uh, uh, hopping, you know, uh, uh, Hamiltonian and then went to k-space and saw that in k-space it, it takes a very interesting form, uh, you know, that even when you do not consider uh, the electron spin, uh, the, the graphene Hamiltonian uh, can be written as, uh, 
of graphene uh, in k-space okay, uh, can be written as uh, kx times uh, uh, you know the Pauli spin matrix. This is you know not even considering spin at this point, but just the ek diagram of it can be written as zero times kx and kx are k zero zero kx times one one zero. So that's the sigma x Pauli matrix plus uh, uh, ky times sigma y Pauli matrix because sigma y all right, just do 0 1 1 0 right sigma y is 0 minus i i and 0 right so uh, and you know there are some constant terms in the front and I'm not bothering to write them of course uh, well well you can write it as what's called the Fermi velocity and a Planck's constant in front, but that's uh, uh, how you can write this uh, minimal form of the Hamiltonian and it has a two component basis, meaning if I were to write my wave function, the wave function looks like this. Uh, it has two components and it has two components here. And if you look carefully at that, uh, what you get is uh, there is a component that lives on A atoms, meaning remember graphene has Two, you know, two atom basis, right? And so on. And so we call one of them as A and the other as B, small a or B, you know. And the other is a function that kind of is, is uh, related to B. Okay. It, it, uh, it has this uh, sub lattice break up into two uh, components. Uh, and this is even if you had only electrons of one spin in graphene, this, is, this would be the case. So sometimes this is referred to as a kind of a pseudo spin you know, state uh, because this is, you know, the lattice uh, or the basis atoms are acting as your spin density, except there's, you know, there's not, not really, so, so sometimes called a pseudo spin sort of uh, symmetry of graphene. You know. and, um, and, and, and because of that, we can write it uh, in terms of the Pauli matrix, of course, uh, uh, you know, we can compose the kx and ky uh, into a vector, right? It's just k in, in a 2D k vector. And uh, sigma, again, you can write it as sigma x, comma, sigma y, comma, sigma z, except here this thing is, well, it doesn't have to be zero. Uh, it, it, it can leave it like that. And you can consider this to be comma zero, you know. And then uh, sigma dot k is just the Hamiltonian, there, right? right? Because that's just kx times that, and, and right? Does that make sense? Okay, so. And the eigenvalues of this uh, um, system, uh, just to be clear again, uh, if I have any Pauli matrix sigma x, y, or z, you know, any one of them, let's say sigma i, and I take a square, what do you get? For the spin matrix squared. It's identity matrix, right? Uh, always. I mean, that, that's the property of the Pauli spin matrix. And what does that mean? It means that if I am looking at any wave function, two component, four component, whatever be it, okay, and I want to find uh, the eigenvalues of the Pauli spin matrix itself, okay, um, uh, does that make sense what I'm asking? What is the eigenvalue? Is it eigen if I find the eigenstates and eigenvalues of the Pauli spin matrix itself, wow. one of. Yeah, one of the things you can do is, is uh, just apply it twice on both sides, okay? Okay. And, uh, uh, and then uh, you know that that is just one, okay? And you look at that, well, that's what you're after, right? So, uh, so but, then, but then you know this is the eigenvalue of square, so if the eigenvalue of square is one, then the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the possibilities are plus and minus one, you know? can't be e to the of i phi. It can be only plus one or minus one, right? Uh, and and uh, so, so that, what does that mean? It means that the uh, eigenvalues are whatever is the diagonal elements, which is actually uh, happens to be zero here, plus minus the off diagonal terms. That's really what it means. Right? And it splits into two, just like spin split into two, you know, plus mu b and minus mu b, exactly in the same way it splits into two here. Again, I mean, that's just uh, uh, meaning uh, if I have any, uh, any, any time I can write my Hamiltonian in, in this form, 
you know, some constants times sigma dot k, then uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, in fact, we generalized it even further, right? Uh, if you uh, just think, think back a little bit. Uh, uh, let me go through that argument one more time. If, if this is the Hamiltonian, what I'm trying to say is, what are the eigenvalues? Maybe you can tell me from here. So if, if this is my Hamiltonian, what are the eigenvalues? Uh, let me write it even more clearly. So that's just a constant. So that will remain. Uh, so the allowed energies. Yeah. Right, right, except uh, it will be the ma energy is the scalar now, right? Right, it is dependent on kx. So uh, you can see that you know, it's the, the magnitude of this is going to be 1, basically, right? And what you will get is plus minus this quantity. Yeah. That's, that's all I'm trying to kind of get to here, is plus minus h bar times vf times absolute value of whatever k, right? And that's because the spin, Pauli spin matrices have eigenvalues of plus minus 1. That's, you know, there's no funny business other than that. It's very straightforward. Uh, that because you square it, you get plus 1. And so square root of plus 1 is plus 1 or minus 1. And it's a two-valued function. Right? So, yeah. uh, OK, good. Uh, so so this, this is what I'm trying to say, that the eigenvalue is always going to be like that. And then the second leap we kind of made, in some sense, uh, was uh, that we realize that uh, no matter what, uh, so this is specifically for graphene, it looks like you can write it in, in terms of Pauli spin matrices. You know? But then we realize that actually any 2 by 2 Hamiltonian, you can write it like that. It, it doesn't have to be just graphene. Any system, gallium nitride, gallium arsenide, you know, topological insulators, spin hull insulators, all of them can be written in this form. You know? And the reason for that is this uh, Pauli spin matrices, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, and the identity matrix, they span all of 2 by 2 matrix space. So any 2 by 2 matrix can be written in this form. And the idea was any Hamiltonian as a result, we can write it as uh, you know, some value of h, uh, which may depend on k's, you know, uh, call it h0, times an identity matrix of 2 by 2, you know, 1, 0, 0, 1, plus, uh, uh, I don't want to kind of write the whole thing again, but essentially what you're going to get is h dot dotted with a sigma vector, just like you have k dot sigma here. The order of dot product doesn't bother us at this point, uh, because I think you know that this, this uh, uh, <laughs> though they are matrices, these things are actually just numbers in the end, right? The kx, kys are just numbers, you know, so it really doesn't. So this is the most general form of any 2 by 2 Hamiltonian is what I'm trying to kind of get to at this point. Right? And as a result, the eigenvalues of this will be what? Of this Hamiltonian. From just you know, looking at this again and saying, oh, well, what, what, what should the eigenvalues be? Right? So uh, remember, this is the diagonal term. right? And the diagonal stays where it is. It, it's, it's not changing, right? Because this is multiplied by the 1 and 1 in the diagonal. So that stays as it is, h0 of k and plus minus absolute value of that. You know, that's, that th so that's how the eigenvalues are going to look. Uh, and, sorry. and this is something I've also asked you to kind of work through in your assignment. And uh, you know, you're going to just get that, right? two eigenvalues. And there'll be a function of k. And these quantities are just scalar functions. Uh, 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 you know, uh, of of uh, uh, the k values. Now, now k, the though it's a two by two Hamiltonian, it's perfectly capable of uh, modeling transport in any dimensions: one D, two D, three D. Doesn't matter. It's just the number of k's will change. We did it for graphene. That's two D. Now we're going to look at for a one D model, which is the first example of a topological insulator, and then. You, you know, if it's 3D, you do a 3D tight binding model and you get some other K, but you'll have KX, KY, and KZ, right? Three direction in which the electrons can move or have momenta. But regardless, they will all kind of collapse into these functions again, right? And you can write it like this again. And uh, so all the 3D topological insulators also are modeled by this, this Hamiltonian. Right? Oh, you, can't, you can't get away from it because it spans every possibility in two by two matrix space, you know? so yeah. OK, and what we'll now see is uh, uh, by looking at this, specifically by looking, 
Um, by the way, maybe you can see that uh, what this does, it, it just introduces a DC offset to, to what you're, uh, you know, uh, basically H0 is, anyway, we'll, we'll look at it as specific examples. It sets the, you know, uh, sort of the zero energy value and then when you turn on magnetic field, things kind of start splitting around it. But, and, and most of the action and all the very phase topological properties depend on this term now. And this is a vector. And uh, remember we talked about, you know, uh, how churn number is a vector related to a vector defined on a closed surface. This is the vector, you know, this is the vector that plays the, the role of, you know, uh, that wraps around or winds around things and whether you can comb it and all that. This is the vector that we are after, right? And it's related very much to the eigenvalues and related to the case, which is the direction of motion of the electron. And so the band structure, the choice of atoms, the choice of way they are arranged in the crystal clearly determine this quantity now, right? And there is no magnetic field, but our whole paradigm or kind of game plan was to see whether we can make use of this K and the band structure to mimic what magnetic field was giving us, like a quantum Hall states and that sort of thing, right? Okay. So, so now doing that for graphene, what we found was uh, 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 that if I take just plain graphene, uh, there is no sigma Z term, it's just sigma X and sigma Y, right? Just that and that. Okay, right? And uh, uh, now, uh, so to be very specific uh, for, uh, you know, the way we wrote this, this term was basically zero for us, for graphene. Right? And then we had plus, uh, for the, you know, uh, upper band, it was plus kx times, uh, so basically what I want to say is uh, that the h of k vector is equal to kx comma ky comma zero, right? Do you see that? Because uh, kx times sigma x is ky. And yeah, I'm just throwing this out. This is a constant. It's, we're interested in the geometric color topological properties. So you can include it here. It just gives you a little shift, you know, a scalar shift, yeah. But, uh, uh, and, and uh, you can, uh, Generally, to do some analysis of it, what I would like to do is kind of normalize it and look at the unit vector because that will tell you, uh, that encodes all the topological properties of it as well. So essentially, how do you normalize it? You just take, you know, kx squared plus ky squared, right? So that's just a unit vector. And uh, one of the things about graphene is uh, when you actually do the full band structure, as I told you, and, uh, you know, you're going to look at it. So, so when you do this and you open it up around the, two Dirac points, there are two, minima, two points or two valleys where this goes to zero. Uh, let me go back here. So the two points are zero comma four pi by three A where A is the lattice constant. Uh, and uh, I think the other is 60 degrees off from here. So there are two points. This is the K point and there's another which is the K prime point. So K point and K prime point if you might. Well, okay, so that's the real space, you know, these two points. And uh, what is very interesting is when you look at it carefully in the K point in the Villon zone, let's, let me sketch it just you know, as a rough picture here, okay? So your EK diagram for the full Hamiltonian is going to look like that, but as we go into the effective, you know, small expansion Hamiltonian around the two points, let's call, you know, one is green color here. That's our uh, K point. And uh, this one here is going to be our K prime point. K prime, and what am I plotting? This is energy versus K, or EK diagram of graphene, right? That's, that's what we are plotting here. E versus K. And uh, really it's KX, KY, because it's you know, two-dimensional two crystal. And uh, uh, I don't know why we went here, but uh, this is the expression yeah, uh, this is when I plot this whole big, big thing here, okay? And then I say, well, it's, and I look at what states are occupied because each carbon atom comes with a certain, so all the states kind of below that will be occupied and all the states, so the formula level will be right here for intrinsic graphene, you know, so right there. You know. And uh, so what is saying here is that uh, the K point is at 0, 0,4 pi by 3a in K space, so 4 pi over 3a. 
uh, and remember how did I get it? You, you, you wrote your full Hamiltonian with the hopping terms, et cetera, and you got, got that. It's just kind of going back a few steps here. Uh, now what we are doing is we are expanding this Hamiltonian around these two points, because that we have located two points of interest. And uh, just as a kind of point of uh, departure here, uh, the wave functions in this point, for example, in k, k, sub uh, k Dirac cone would have primarily the sublattice A, for example. You know? And in k prime, they'll be primarily composed of orbitals from here. You know? so, so there's also that little distinction between the two uh, Dirac points here. And one of the, uh, you know, kind of, uh, so, so this, is, this is a vector, you can call it, uh, well, uh, D of k, which is the normalized vector of, uh, of this H of k. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, this is the magnitude and this is the direction of the H of k vector. Uh, D of k in this valley has plus kx. And there, you know, a lot of these plus minus sign switchings which you have to be a little careful about now. Whereas k prime valley, let's call it D of big K. You know. But the, this vector for k prime valley will be the same denominator because that doesn't depend on sign. But this becomes minus kx, okay? And in, this is where you can see that the two vectors are kind of going around in opposite orientations. One is spinning in this way, for example, the other is spinning in that way, plus kx and minus kx. So this just comes out from just solving the Hamiltonian. There's nothing new you have to do. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, I was going to kind of ask where the minus came from. Like, where, where the what? Think about where the like, minus kx came from. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what I wrote here, this thing is true for, uh, you know, you have to do this expansion for both valleys, this valley and this valley separately. Right? When you do it for this valley, you're going to get a plus sign here. So I should really put it here right now and say that there is a plus or a minus, and this plus stands for the, when you expand it around one of the you know, valleys, and this stands for the other valley. That, that's where it comes from. So one way to write it, and if you read some of the papers, even the uh, you know, paper that I posted, uh, you will see that sometimes the Hamiltonian is written as uh, some, instead of writing that, you know, this plus minus sign is, you know, sigma x is your spin. This, they sometimes call it a tau or a tau z. This is a valley index which can uh, assume values of, sorry, plus one or minus one, for example, right? And then they just write, write a tau z here. And they think, well, if you're in k, va k valley, take plus one. If you're in k prime, take minus one, for example. Yeah. Um, what's the field space interpretation like if you look at that graphing structure. Yeah, uh, right, yeah. So the, what I was trying to say is uh, in the real space uh, picture, the, for example, the k-valley electrons, if, they, if you are looking at electrons in, the, in, in, in this k-valley, okay, they will be, let's say, you know, A and B, you can call whichever you want to be A. So they will be more, you know, m around the A sides. You know. Whereas k prime, you know, K prime, for example, will be the electron orbitals will be primarily composed of, you know, B side, B -side uh, atoms, carbon atoms, for example. Okay. That's one interpretation. They're, I mean, they're all linearly combined, but this is when you decompose it, you will see it's something like this. You know, when you, when you go back and look near the Dirac points, near at the minima. When you go out into the in, uh, away from the Dirac points, of course, there's a lot of hybridization and all that. You know, you, the the, the bonds, the orbitals mix very much, you know, strongly and all that, but, but uh, because they are able to, you know, you give them a lot of k, if you might, right? Uh, and they're able to hop or move if you want to think of it classically that way in real space, but okay. So, so what I'm uh, really after is uh, I, I want to kind of uh, emphasize that uh, in a way, once you do the tight binding, you should be able to get this this picture that my eigenvalues would be this, but then this is actually a vector here, and I can find a unit vector like this now, right? And this unit vector will tell you everything you need to know about the topological properties of this crystal now. Whether its churn number is zero, one, whether it will have topologically protected edge states, whether it will not have any of those, whether it will be a trivial, you know, ordinary insulator, 
uh, with no edge states, all of that stuff is buried inside this quantity now. Right? So let me make it a little more general instead of for graphene, uh, because this is for graphene as an example. Uh, uh, so I can, uh, I'll just generalize it and say that why, why just say kx, ky, kz for graphene? In general, it is hx, comma, hy, comma, hz, right? Whatever the things here, right? And in the denominator, similarly, you have you know, hx squared plus hy squared plus hz squared. It's the most general form of it. Okay. And uh, you can have two valleys. And uh, if I have two valleys and I want to include that, then I can, again, you know, put a minus sign in front. So let's not try to rewrite it and just say that I may have a plus or a minus sign here based on if I have valley, you know, uh, uh, if that uh, energy term a, a kx, uh, or rather, a, a, the coefficient of sigma x is different for the two values. It could be, or it may not be. So it depends. Okay? So for graphene, it is. It is different. But for the, there can be other crystals where it's actually, actually exactly the same. You know? so, so in which case, it doesn't have to be. So this is the most general form of uh, your uh, Newtonian. And let's actually look at. For example, for graphene, how uh, this pl how, how it looks, you know, in figures, how 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 might it look? <coughs> so I'll go there. So I, I did try to kind of put it together in this file, and uh, uh, you know, nothing very fancy more than what I just wrote there. It's essentially just saying that well, here's your definition of this whole quantity. He is defining my general 2 by 2 Hamiltonian. And I've defined it in terms of a few parameters, maybe three parameters. It doesn't need to be three. It could be more than that. But uh, you know, here I've defined with three parameters. And you can see what it looks like, right? Very much like a spin Hamiltonian, except, uh, and then here are the eigenvalues. And here are the eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian itself. Okay? And uh, so this is the most general form. So. Uh, and what we'll do now is run it for just graphene and see that, well, it will give us exactly what we you know, talked about. Our h of z is 0, right? We just saw that. h of x is just kx, h of y, you know, this thing is ky, and hz is 0 for graphene, right? There's no z component of motion uh, of electrons. And, and so the Hamiltonian, you just say that, well, take my more general form, use these three quantities for my functions, okay? Right? And then uh, it'll give you all the, you know, Hamiltonian of graphene, eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and then say, you know, plot the eigenvalues. Here's the plot. It's just one of the cones, not both. There's another one of these in k prime point. You know, it's just one of the cones here. I could have made a plot of the whole thing, but, you know, this, uh, I think we understand what, uh, what is uh, happening here. And in two dimension, okay, yeah, it's just uh, symmetric around the Dirac point here. Very importantly, the two bands are meeting. The, this band and that band are meeting here. Okay? And uh, from our formulas for Berry phase long time ago, not long, too, too long ago, but, you know, uh, uh, we, we talked about here's the, here's the Berry phase. The denominator will blow up there, right? But, sorry, the denominator will go to zero. So the Berry phase will blow up there. Okay? That, that's something we have talked about. And, uh, uh, and, and then what, um, you know, the other thing is uh, this, uh, so you can calculate the very curvature and all that stuff for this. But uh, what I want to do is uh, now start saying that uh, uh, I, I uh, you know, hz is zero. And I, I, I discussed last time that uh, this term, the third, you know, component here, is what is responsible for giving uh, mass or effective mass, for example, to any band structure. Right? This is something we talked about in the last time. And the reason for that is, uh, you know, HZ matrix, uh, sorry, right? Uh, HZ is, uh, sorry, sigma Z, which is, uh, you know, the, the, what HZ dot products into is 1, 0, 0, minus 1, right? Right, it's 1, 0, 0, minus 1. And you see uh, the upper column here, uh, upper row here is kind of the A site, uh, you know, business of our A site, and then lower column here is business for B site, and this is 
you know, A, A hopping term, this is B, B hopping term. In other words, this is the on-site energy. Does that make sense? Okay. And sigma Z is, whenever I have sig non-zero sigma Z term, that means my on-site energies of A and B are different. Right? That can happen because of various things. It could be because I have two different atoms here, like boron and nitrogen, for example, boron nitride. Or I could have some other things. I could put graphene on top of boron nitride, in which case it is seeing slightly different. You know, one is on carbon atom is on top of boron, the other is on top of nitrogen. So it's experiencing slightly different potentials, you know, local potentials. So that's how, so basically this term is uh, uh, going to introduce uh, into the uh, Hamiltonian, uh, uh, basically it, it will not allow the bands to meet anymore. It will split it, right? can see that hopefully. Uh, before it splits it, the graphene Hamiltonian uh, has eigenvalues of plus minus k, right? Plus minus of uh, kx squared plus ky squared, right? You can write it as h bar times vf times that. This is the eigenvalues. These are the eigenvalues of uh, graphene. And if you look at it carefully, you realize that this is very similar to you know, h bar times velocity times k, uh, uh, well, uh, so h bar times k is what? Momentum, right? Times velocity. So that looks just like the energy dispersion of a uh, light, you know, which is p, you know, uh, times c, momentum and then speed of light, right? It looks very much like that. <coughs> Uh, and you know that photons have no mass. So this band structure or this, this sort of eigenvalue is said to be massless. There's no mass. This is an effective, you know, mass is zero. I mean, there's no mass. But obviously, this is an electron. It's not moving at the speed of light, right? So, so but then what we're saying is this band structure has that uh, uh, degeneracy and it has uh, the bands meet and therefore the bands, when they meet, they must, it must be, you know, it's around it, it's linear here. You know, energy is proportion, linearly proportional to momentum, and therefore uh, it has no mass. And and, and uh, ba basically, uh, if you uh, you know kind of go back and look at uh, the Dirac equation, uh, B C whole square plus M C squared whole square, right? So that that was his equation that saying that you know if I have a rest mass of anything, I must have this term too, not just P times C, right? Uh, anything that has mass, electron, proton, neutron, you know, this is, this is kind of the rest mass term. So if I include in this quantity, uh, in order to give graphene artificially perhaps, or, you know, or you look for crystals that uh, have an opening of a band gap, you can add a little k naught square here, for example, right? And then this is not dependent on kx and ky, and that will immediately open a band gap now in the, in the material. Does that make sense? Let me just add that. And uh, you know, a general way to write that would be, again, uh, trying to use a simpler notation and saying h bar and vf are equal to, you know, you know, normalize it out to 1 at this point. We say it's kx squared plus ky squared plus something that really is related to mass now, for example, right? Uh, if, I, if I have that, then uh, when kx, ky is 0, I still have plus minus m here, right? And that's my gap, right? 2 times m is the gap. And how do I get that? Uh, what I was trying to get that artificially, you, you can bring it in by adding an m times sigma z to your Hamiltonian. Right? Do you see that? I mean, if I add a mass times sigma z to my original Hamiltonian, which was kx times sigma x plus ky times sigma y, and if I add that, I'll immediately get that. Right? So you're adding a mass term. This is the Language used, mathematically is rather straightforward, but this is the language used if you are reading papers or review articles, you will see that, yeah. No, exactly right, because I've set everything to one at this point. You can obviously always reinstate. Uh, no, it's a good point, because it sometimes is very confusing. Let me write it in, in its full uh, glory, if you might, right? So, uh, so, so uh, it will look like h bar times vf, okay, square, you know, kx squared plus ky squared plus uh, band, you know, the band gap over two whole squared. You know, this is this is how it's going to look. You know, the delta is the gap now, so, so. and you know, the m is just a convenient notation. You're just saying. You know. The m is just is that, that's m star, or is that the rest? 
it has nothing to do with that. You know, that's very important. M as units of, all right, you know, forget uh, the quantity of M. I, I don't want to kind of say that it's the band gap that appears here. That's all there is. Now, if you want to find effective mass, you can go back, expand it around k is equal to zero. And uh, then, of course, the effective mass will be related to both of these quantities. Right? You can take the curvature around k is equal to zero, and you'll get the effective mass. Right? Does that make sense? I mean, this is just a parameter. You can write it in terms of uh, the m also if you want, but you know, this is the physical meaning of it. Right? So, yeah. And, and uh, uh, let's look at it how, how one might, uh, you know, how, how that might look in pictures again. So I, I just added that here. Uh, I didn't, you know, try to, I, I, I didn't try to, uh, I just want to kind of illustrate uh, the, the physics of it. So I, I did not uh, include all the units of h-bar and all that. Just I've written it in kx and ky and m, okay? And remember, m is zero is real graphene. M is non-zero is where we are introducing this sort of, uh, you know, sublattice asymmetry, and then it opens a band gap right away, and we'll see it will open a finite Berry curvature now everywhere in in in, in the case space. You know, so so it will, and it will have now a valley hall effect and all that business now, right? Uh, um, just to be uh, connect to what we discussed earlier, uh, this is what we have done here is we have introduced. Uh, uh, we have introduced, uh, so uh, when you read uh, Chen, the review article in, uh, that is posted, you will see this expression, for example. Here, Qx is Kx, basically. Sigma x, you know, tau z is plus minus one. In one valley, it's plus one. The other valley is minus one. Just the numbers. And Qy is and sigma y. Here's my delta by two. This is the gap, okay? Gap by two and sigma z. And this is the gap graphene. And uh, this is the Berry curvature of graphene. And what we are trying to say is when you make a plot of it, in one valley, it will be positive, of course, because there's a tau z here, okay? In the other valley, it will be negative, okay? And then what does that mean now? Uh, because the electric field, because you get a velocity, electrons that are moving, doing quantum transport in this material, when you inject it into the material and there's electric field, let's say, along x direction, if the electrons are in this valley, you get E cross this much magnitude here, and that is a velocity, maybe it's going, you know, in the, plus, uh, sorry, in the minus y direction, whereas this one will go in plus y direction. Right? This is a small component of the velocity, which is in addition to the standard velocity that you are going in the x direction, the vx, but there will be a little vy. For these valley electrons, there will be a small component of vy this way, for example, right? And so the electron will start kind of going this way. Right? It will turn. Right? Similarly, that one, there will be a, small, a large velocity in the x direction, but a small component in the, in, in the minus y direction. So you start kind of going this way. And so you get a valley filter, meaning the, then you try to detect electrons that are coming at this edge. They will be perhaps from here in this case space. And electrons that come out from here will be from here. And this is kind of a valley splitting of the electrons. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about like, what, where this decay between crossed in the uh, term comes from? Like, I know, like, I guess I know what it means kind of when I look at it, but yeah. like how did we figure out that the XDT is proportional to that? Oh, you mean this term? Yeah. Like, okay, yeah. Like, how do we get into the equation? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, no, of course, I'll uh, talk about that right now. Um, so, the, let me also use a few of these. Uh, right there. So, um, you know, the, maybe I had changed the order of slides here. Okay. So, uh, you know, if you, if you go back and look at how, how one gets the velocity from quantum states of electrons, right, the, uh, the velocity of any k state, for example, right, is uh, uh, really the rate of change of uh, the, you know, x, Let's just talk about one dimension for now, for, for argument's sake at this point, okay? Uh, right, the velocity is the rate of change of the x, x expectation value. And uh, um, now, now, now if, if, I, if I look at uh, the situation where I allow for a Berry phase, uh, so, so what, what, what I mean by that is you can you know, think of it as uh, uh, 
dx operator, you know, something like that, okay, of any quantum state now, right? And uh, uh, so there is, uh, if I don't have a Berry phase, uh, you know, if I, I, I'm looking at a block function picture where this is e to the power i, you know, kx, u, and k of x, you know, then I will get only the first term, and I'm not trying to derive that because, that, you know, you can derive it, it's done in most books and all that. But the moment I allow for the Berry phase, I must, you know, include this e to the power i gamma factor here, right? And maybe e to the power minus i gamma factor here, okay? So, and as a result, these terms acting on the Berry phase will give you another term now. You know? I'm just outlining it, and that's where it comes from. I mean, and, and, and you know, this is where, so this will give you the first term, and this quantity here, I've written it in, in, in this way. This is a function of u, which is the block function here. Okay. It will give you the second term, which is the very phase. No? Yeah, so I did. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, now, now looking at uh, the, the uh, you know, the, the, the graphene. Uh, so what we are trying to do is uh, ask uh, how do I find the churn number of, of this material or how do I find the Berry curvature of this material. And once I have this expression for the Hamiltonian, uh, I can go back to the expression for Berry curvature, apply it and get this, you know, for a two, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, so something you, you can please work through in the assignment problem. This is very, one of the useful things that you can do. Uh, uh, and uh, after we get that, the physical mechanism should be relatively simple to understand if you believe that, you know, here's the velocity, right? So, so then the physical transport mechanism is relatively easy to understand. Now, uh, what we want to do though is, uh, so here's the Berry curvature, you know, here's gap graphene. I think it plotted it here. You know, if you give it a mass, of course, it's going to, you know, open the gap and it will behave like a standard semiconductor, if you might, right? But what we'll see now is it may not be a very standard semiconductor. These are what are called bulk properties. These are not edge properties of the material. Okay? And we'll see that soon very now because uh, if it has a non-zero, if it has a non-trivial churn number, it will have very interesting, you know, edge properties that cannot be seen when you plot a bulk, bulk uh, energy K diagram, EK diagram. You can't see it. No? So you, you must look at something else. And what is that something else? It's this, this vector. This is what we're going to look at, you know, and then see that this will tell you whether it's a standard, you know, semiconductor with no funny edge states, with no funny very, very phases, or is it something that has very phases and churn numbers, except you can't see it if you just make a plot of that. You, know, you can't see it. So, uh, and then, yeah, so the mass opens, but uh, remember this mass is, is, is uh, in two valleys, not just one. So that's an important point. Okay. So now here's the Berry curvature plot. This is, uh, you know, we have a formula for it and we know that if I apply a mass, if I have a mass, the Berry curvature kind of peaks at the Dirac point, you know, it reaches a maxima around here and then it goes down. But the more important point is now Berry curvature is finite away from the Dirac points. It's finite. And as you take it towards zero, uh, you know, it gets more and more like graphene, and of course it, be it becomes very, very sharply peaked around the Dirac point. And at the limit of, uh, you know, clean graphene with no sublattice, you know, no mass term, it really becomes a delta function. But it's a positive delta function in K, and it's a negative delta function in minus K. You know. so that, that's how the uh, Berry curvature will look for uh, graphene. Nothing to do at all with spin. This is purely, this happens for both spins. There are up and down spins at all points in K. You know. This is nothing to do with spin at all at this point. Right? It's just the nature of the crystal, uh, the way the atoms are arranged and you know, the lattice constants and the uh, geometry of the crystal. You know, right? that, that's, that is responsible for this behavior. Right? So, yeah. Okay, so now let's look at, uh, uh, let's visualize now what is going on with the uh, uh, what I mentioned is uh, we, we, we see that there's a Berry curvature. Uh, now, one of the important things we can conclude right away about the Berry curvature is if it's positive here and it's negative here, when you integrate it over the whole Brillouin zone, it's zero because they're exactly equal and opposite, right? And as a result, if your integral of the Berry curvature over a full Brillouin zone is zero, 
what does you know our Taoist sort of picture tell you? That your Hall conductivity is going to be zero, meaning there is no quantum Hall quantization. This thing is zero. Make sense? I mean, so that that's that's the physical consequence on quantum transport. That because I have positive and negative very curvatures. Yes, you have a, f you actually get a pi very phase in K space when you integrate it, and a minus uh, in, in, uh, in the K valley, you will get, let me write that down. Uh, I've asked you to kind of prove it. So when I do my Berry curvature integral around this point, in K, I, I, around the K point, uh, 1 over 2 pi times the Berry, what am I doing, D2K times the Berry curvature. Okay. You, you will get a plus pi, okay? And when you do it around the uh, k prime, d2k, you'll get a minus pi. Okay. And, uh, uh, and, and, and then, then, then it is, uh, if you do this over the whole Brillouin zone, it is this plus that, right? And that's just zero. Because Brillouin zone, first Brillouin zone contains both k and k prime points, so yeah. Uh, you know that it is blowing up here. I, I've t told you also, showed you figures now, it's blowing up, so you don't want to do it that way, right? What you want to do is, you, in the assignment problem, you want to go in and instead of trying to find the Berry curvature, go through, you know, uh, the, or the Berry, so remember I asked you for Berry phase, right? Uh, Berry phase is, uh, sorry, I think I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I asked you for the Berry phase, okay? Phase is related to curvature, but uh, so let me just make it correct. Okay, this is the very phase of the k point, okay? and this will lead uh, this will lead to a minus pi very phase in the k prime point. You know, that that's what I meant to say. Right? This is always an integer, and this will be plus one, and this will be minus one. For example, that's what I meant. This is just a number, right? So the Berry phase, uh, remember you can do it either by a int line integral, okay, dk, or you can do a surface integral, right? Right? Uh, what I'm saying is this is a bad idea because it's blowing up, right? You, but this is good. You should use this one, right? Uh, use this one, uh, and ak is just, uh, you know, u uh, and k, which is the, you know, this function here, this function. I've written it for you also in the slides if you want to use it or not. Uh, you can uh, get it from here directly. By the way, uh, I, I think just your question, he, here's the derivation part of it, you know, just to kind of go through that. I, I was thinking about this, but yeah. Uh, and you can, it's in that paper, and here are the functions. You can use these functions to, eigenfunctions to plug in here and integrate, you know, d by dk uh, with two components, u and k. Uh, dot dk. Uh, what I'm saying is when you integrate around a little loop around the Dirac co cone here, you will, you, you will get a pi or a minus pi based on the two bits. So, uh, okay, so now uh, uh, w w w what I want to kind of look at is that vector uh, d of k, sorry, where did I put it? In this vector for graphene, okay? But I want to look at it for gapped graphene, you know, which, which has this artificial mass term now and ask uh, uh, that, uh, you know, um, can, I, uh, can I look at it and find whether it has any topologically interesting properties because when I try to find my churn number from here, it says, well, that's just zero, right? And I don't seem, oh, th this is not gra gapped graphene. This is, you know, uh, uh, w w w with, with uh, the, without the mass term, it will blow up. But with the mass term, it won't blow up, but still this will be plus and minus pi. And then when you add it, the churn number will still be zero if you add the mass term to. It's not going to change, you know. And uh, this is uh, encoded in this vector. And the vector for graphene is going to be what? Kx, Ky, and this is the mass term, right? And square root of Kx square plus Ky square plus the mass square term. That's the vector that we are going to look at. In the k valley, it will have plus Kx sign. In the k prime valley, it will have minus Kx sign. That's the vector. And let's look at how that vector is going to move. Uh, so that's what I'm plotting here, okay? So this, uh, this is the vector, you know, kx by this, ky by this, and m by that, okay? 
and it's really not very difficult to see what I'm trying to do. Uh, if you look at the mass term, uh, let's put it to zero first. Uh, all right, let's put that to zero. Uh, so the mass term is zero. What does that mean? Uh, if the mass term is zero, obviously this component, the z component of that vector is zero. Right? Physically, what does that mean? That means that vector will always be in the, on the equator. It's going to always point on the equator x, y, because the z component is zero. It's not going to get out of the plane, right? That vector, okay? So, uh, but then as you start changing kx and ky, what you are physically doing in, or rather what you are doing is in the, in the graphene's k space, so let's look at, you know, this is the k and k prime points, so you can think of it as, uh, you know, the k space is also a hexagon, you know, the billion zone. And you can think of it this way, if I move out of these Dirac points and I am like here or here or here or here, my kx and ky are finite, right? And I can see how is this vector moving, and you'll see it's going to move, you know, in, in, in some way. Let's say I move the ky, it's going to just move on the equator, right? It's not going to go out of the plane at all, right? So, and then similarly, you cannot change your kx, it's going to start changing uh, the direction, it may, uh, you know, have some jumps or whatever, but uh, it, it will always stay on the equator, that's kind of the important thing, right? And if you make a connection of that to what we talked earlier, uh, is uh, you know, this has, uh, because it's a, effectively a planar surface, it's not, the vector is not able to get out. It's not, uh, um, it's on a flat land, if you might. It's not experiencing a curvature. Right? So, so that will, that immediately means, uh, so this is, uh, 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 this is the kind of, uh, related to what's called the winding number now of this vector, you know, how, and we're going to ask, as I move my kx and ky, allow the electron to experience, you know, the entire billion zone kx, ky is allowed. What part of this sphere is this tip of the vector, uh, you know, covering? Is it covering the entire sphere? If it wraps around the entire sphere, uh, if it is not able to cover the entire sphere, it only goes over one hemisphere, then the winding number is zero. It never w wrapped around the whole sphere. You know? If it wraps around the whole sphere once, then the winding number would be one. If it you know, if you, ch if you move over the entire billion zone and it wraps the sphere twice, then the, you know, uh, uh, this is actually called the index, not exactly the winding number, but I think you can see the vector kind of moving around the sphere. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, exactly, you mean by wrapping around the sphere? Like at any point, the vector is pointing at somewhere in the sphere? That's correct, yeah. So what I mean is, uh, you know, if I systematically go over this whole surface, okay? let the kx and ky vary such that I cover the entire billion zone, okay? All of it, right? And I, you know, leave traces of wherever this tip was. You know? So that will traverse an area of the surface, right? Does that make sense? That's, and the solid angle is really, I mean, it, it will extend, a, so, so that's what I mean by, uh, you know, how many times it wraps. You know? Obviously, it, uh, for example, let's see, you know, m is equal to, uh, first of all, if it is, if there is no m, it cannot even get out of the equator, so there's no chance of wrapping at all, right? And that's pure graphene, which has zero churn number. There's no, you know, no wrapping involved, none of that. But the moment I put a mass on it, uh, let's put the mass positive, okay? Uh, and then obviously now it, it can go out, right? it can get out of the plane and it can go towards the z, you know, the north pole of this sphere, right? Right? And now if I, uh, let's say I put my mass term here, you know, uh, whatever be it, you know, if it's this value, uh, it will, you know, kind of move around as I move my kx, ky, it will start doing some circles or, you know, uh, different kinds of shapes. You can run both of them if you might. It will wind, right? Uh, and, and then uh, what I'm trying to say is, if my mass is positive, this vector can now traverse the uh, upper half of the upper, hemi uh, or the upper hemisphere only. You know? So it can go through the North Pole once in a while. And, and at some points, when does it go to the North Pole? When my kx, ky are around, say, the, you know, this point. Or if my kx, ky are around here, both of the times it will go to the North Pole. Does that make sense? Right? Yeah. Now you can check that. It will never go to the South Pole. It will always go to the North Pole. 
And only if I put my mass term to be positive in one k and negative in other k, it can go to the south pole too now. Because this, you know, this uh, kz vector or the z vector depends on the sign of the mass. So, okay, that's a minus. If this is positive, this, it can never wrap the whole, the tip cannot go to the south pole. So if I go to the negative, obviously now it can go to the south pole. And uh, uh, I cannot do both positive and negative mass in the same valley. Does that make sense? Uh, because uh, the mass term is, is uh, well, it's a parameter. It is attached to a k space, right? And, and uh, I, I, I can put my m to be positive in one valley and negative in the other or positive in both. What I'm trying to say is if m is positive in both, this vector is not wrapping, or the tip of the vector, when I traverse the entire Boolean zone, covers. So when I change kx and ky, it is basically just uh, you know, traversing this line. But as I go, you know, change my, if I let my m be positive, then as I go close to the to Dirac points, both of these Dirac points map to the North Pole. So essentially, it will cover this whole, the tip will be able to cover this entire upper hemisphere, but not, none of the bottom one. But if my mass term for this valley is plus one, and mass term for this valley, k prime, is minus one, then what I'm trying to get to is you can now cover the entire. Okay. And the number of times this uh, vector goes around the sphere is the number that occurs in the transverse Hall conductance, the, the quantized Hall conductance. It's the number of times it goes around. You know, right? So, uh, or in other words, uh, my conductance, the Hall conductance is E squared by H times this number and uh, you know the churn number and what I'm trying to say is this is also your churn number. It's another way to look at the churn number. That's the number of times this en you know, uh, energy dependent unit vector or the eigenvalue dependent unit vector wraps around the whole sphere. So that's the physical meaning of it. If it wraps around twice, churn number is two, five times, you know, it's five. Uh, but uh, we saw that for pure graphene, it never gets out of the equator, so you don't even have one. But even if you get out of the equator by with the same mass in both same mass term in both side, uh, case points, you only do half, so still your turn number is zero. And this, how many times does the this area wrap around the sphere is always an integer. You know, it's zero, one, two, three, four. There is no you know one point five to that. So, um, okay, so. Uh, the question, though, you know, the discovery of topological insulators came from by thinking about that, uh, uh, you know, uh, people obviously found quantum Hall effect in traditional semiconductors and with high magnetic fields. Now the question is, uh, so, you know, Duncan Haldane asked, can I create in graphene-like structure a situation where I will, you know, give it this, you know, non-zero, uh, 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 a finite churn number, which would then Without a magnetic field, still give me a quantized you know, Hall effect, quantum Hall effect without magnetic field. And so you can see now that the minimal way you can do that is if your mass term is positive here in the k, k valley and negative here in the k prime valley. Right? That was Haldane's model. There's some more detail to it. You know, you add, uh, you add a, a second lattice site and all that sort of thing. That's a physical way to kind of emulate that. Or you add some phase dependent, you know. Uh, phase dependent hopping terms that's another way to realize it physically but the end the essence of the problem is that you have added a, a sublattice site uh, which is uh, uh, ch changing your total churn number or you know changing your total berry curvature from you know what we saw is it you know in k and k prime it looked like that right so the area was zero now we just flipped one of them back like that right and then you have a you know non zero integral now right that's the idea, and you get an idea of a quantum Hall state without a magnetic field now by just playing with these terms now, right? Uh, this was obviously theoretically predicted, and uh, uh, by the way, there was a question. Yeah, yeah. Um, So this tells you, it, it tells you the churn number, it doesn't tell you the region inside which these sites were suited on. Right? Yeah. Um, but this is the cycloids. Say that again a little louder. It doesn't tell you the regions of the Brion zone at which you, these cycloids occur. 
so actually, uh, remember, there is no magnetic field here, right? So that you already said. Uh, now, this is there is exactly uh, there is no magnetic field at all, you know. But the crystal structure is such, you know, or, or rather the properties of the crystal, you know, the way the atoms are arranged, you know, and symmetries are giving it the appearance of a magnetic field now. You know, because you have designed it, you have somehow, you, first of all, you get graphene, and I said, well, because no wrapping, there is no churn number, right? And I said, well, let's try to break that and, and see whether I can get. Uh, uh, so, so in graphene, for example, what you got was a negative delta and a positive delta, and the total integral of the Berry curvature is zero. Right? So the churn number is zero. Then I said, well, let me add a mass term. In a mass term, when I add a mass term, I will get a finite Berry curvature, and then I can get a valley Hall effect because I can sample a region of K space and I have enough electrons that they can see left and right. It will give you a valley Hall effect, but still churn number is zero. So you got a valley filter, but still churn number is zero. Now what uh, Holden is saying is uh, uh, I have a way to actually give it a finite churn number, which is you know, a non-zero churn number, only if I flip it. And how do I flip it? I need to add this mass term, which has opposite signs in the two valleys, and then, then you get that. Now, how you add it is a separate matter, but you know, if you can do that by engineering the you know, material in a certain way using spin or some other parameter. You know, uh, but right now, we are uh, saying that if you can do that, you will get a quantum Hall effect without external magnetic field. That, that, that's the message here. And, and in pictures, you're, 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 you're this uh, vector is uh, kind of wrapping around. The, the, the area or the patch covered by the tip of the, you know, of, imagine the tip is, has some color on it and it's kind of painting on the, on the surface of the sphere. You can look at after you have traversed all possible kx, ky values in the billion zone, first billion zone, what is the total area, you know, right? And if you have painted twice, you must count it twice, you know, so, so then, then you'll have a number of two, four, whatever be it, you know, so. Okay, so that's, uh, 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 the first kind of idea that there's some something interesting about this structure, and uh, uh, now uh, meaning you can, in principle, get a quantum Hall's uh, you know sort of a behavior without uh, an external magnetic field if you are able to create your crystal in that way. Okay. Uh, now, uh, what we'll do next is look at uh, the first you know just carry this over to uh, the idea of the topological insulator now. Uh, what is the difference? Uh, so I have a quantum Hall state. Uh, physically, what is going on here is if I had one with a magnetic field, it was very clear that I mean, I'll have electrons kind of hopping or skipping orbits or like that and, and going around the edges, but, but nothing much in the bulk because in the bulk, they're all doing closed loops orbits. Right? There's no conductivity. It's like atoms and then you know, conductors at the edges. But now what we have done is we have turned off the magnetic field completely. And if I am able to realize the Haldane picture, which uh, you know, again, he, uh, you know, I think very, very rightfully also, uh, uh, was uh, awarded you know, the prize last year. Uh, not last year, two years ago, right? Uh, so Duncan Haldane, who came up with the model right after the quantum Hall effect discovery, was uh, the other person who realize that you know you could do that you know with uh, just pure materials without external magnetic fields okay and next is uh, you know uh, where where the idea of topological insulator comes about now it's a slight twist on this okay so what we are saying is uh, with holden's picture and uh, you know valley dependent mass term you get a topological insulator state which all we are saying is if i were try to push a current or apply electric field in the x direction and I measure my conduct transverse conductance, which is, you know, Jx over, uh, over, sorry, Jy over Ex. I can get an integer times e squared by h. You know, that that's what I'm saying. Uh, you know, n nothing more than that at this point. Right? You can ask where is the current flowing and all that stuff, and you'll see uh, indeed there is current flowing at the edges, and it's very much like a quantum Hall state, except oh, sorry. except there is no external magnetic field. You know, that's kind of the major difference here. Right? Now, uh, if, you, if you remember, uh, the way uh, we were thinking about uh, the, 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 the Landau levels of a crystal 
you know, once you apply a magnetic field, the picture was you have these energies, density of states, right? You, you have these density of states that are filled, filled, and then there's empty. And if your Fermi level is anywhere in the gap, you get the quantum Hall, you know, state. And uh, and and the uh, picture to have in mind is that there are states at the edge that are conducting current, meaning they're they're propagating in the case kx or you know uh, minus kx directions, and uh, because they are conducting, uh, they're spatially localized to the edges. You know? and, and this is something the idea of topological insulator will now bring in. You know? Uh, in the Holden states, uh, if I put two types of carriers of up and down spin, you know, now the spin makes an appearance, you know, up and down spin. Both of them can go to the right, and both of them can go to the left here. You know? so, so, and, and so there will be two channels, uh, you know, uh, left going states, both of them, you know, one is up and the other is down, and right going states, the one is up, the other is down, and, and so on. So there's this spin degeneracy. Okay? Uh, and we are now going to introduce the uh, a state where even that is broken. And uh, if your electrons are going to the right, they must be all up spin. If your electrons are going to the left, they must be down spin. And the momentum and the spin get locked to each other. Meaning, if you're going in one direction, it has a unique spin now. Right? And that's uh, one class of topological insulators, and which is kind of very useful for m perhaps making magnetic devices if you push current this way. You know, it will only inject one type of spin into the into 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 this, and this is this can be a room temperature effect. For example, the first demo of that was done in uh, Professor Dan Ralph's group here at Cornell uh, a couple of years ago. You know, where they take a magnet and put a topological insulator material underneath it, and they push current this way, it flips the magnet that way, push current that way, it's the other uh, flips the magnet the other way. You know, and and, and there's this kind of good spin to charge transfer and that sort of thing. Okay. So let's look at a base, the most basic topological insulator. I'll have only time for this, but uh, now if you are able to grasp, you know, if you are comfortable with what we talked about here, this would be very easy to understand now, right? Any questions on that? I know, you know, I'm going through a little fast as a summary, but uh, okay, let's look at instead of 2D, let's make it simpler. Look at, look at a one-dimensional problem. This is chapter one in that, you know, uh, posting that I had. Okay, you can read that. Uh, so uh, the picture is we have a long chain of uh, atoms. Let's say carbon atoms, if you might, in polyacetylene or something like that. Carbon atoms again, except uh, there's a slight twist to it. Uh, the bonds between, you know, if you're going this way in space, you know, uh, are stronger, let's say, than the bonds that way, or they're different. The hopping term here is V, here is W. It's the only difference, but you know, in general. And then you can say, well, here's my unit cell and all that stuff, and you write your Hamiltonian for it, go through the entire process again. And what we want to show is this structure has uh, uh, you know, a non-zero churn number situation as well. You know, and, and this will form a state which is a topological state, but this will highly, it, it will very transparently show you what do we mean by an edge state. You know? So what we'll see is if we break some of the bonds here, or make one of these hopping terms zero, you, you, in some cases you will have completely a, you know, what you call as an ordinary insulator. You will break it up into, okay, before even we go there, let me just tell you this is, we'll go through a lot of math, but in the end what we'll realize is we could have said that even without that. You know, here's the deal. Let's look at it. So here's, if I can group my atoms this way, okay? This is my group, and, okay? And then let's say I break uh, the, uh, the, the bonds, these bonds, you know, the W bonds here, okay? Then you can see I have one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, whatever. I have dimers or molecules of these left over, right? They're all the same, right? And they're like, you know, each of them is now disconnected, so they're all insulators, you know? They're all insulators. There's no electrical conduction through them now because I've broken the bond. I can't, if I inject electron, I can't get out on that side now, right? The insulators. Okay, so that's, that's a, but then all of them are exactly the same. Right, and, and that would be called a uh, unfortunate. This unfortunate name because uh, they call it a trivial insulator. It's nothing trivial about it, you know, but it's, it's called a trivial insulator. <laughs> in fact, the trivial insulator is what makes the supercomputer in your you know cell phone work, right? It's a silicon, right? But uh, anyway, that's the name, trivial insulator. Okay, or uh, but if you break these bonds, you see now. Okay, if you break these bonds, what you're left with is something somewhat different. It's not the same anymore. Because what you're left with is, on the left side, you have one atom left. And then you have all these molecules left 
two, 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 and then you have one atom on the right side again. You know, so so let me just highlight that. Uh, you know, yeah. So if you break these bonds, you have just a series of all identically looking molecules. But if you break these bonds, now you have something like that, right? And these two are not the same as these two, right? Those are all the weak bonds on the bottom. Yes, let's consider that. I mean, basically, if you have an asymmetry in the two bonds, you will get this. Okay. And this is the extreme case where you actually break the bond, right? But if you have any asymmetry, you will get it. And and this is interesting because this atom. Uh, uh, clearly is, is only at the edge, it can, it's not inside the bulk here, right? And then we'll see that the wave function will kind of decay inside. And this is the 1D analog of a topological insulator where the states, these are the, you know, for a one dimension, the edge states are points, right? These are like quantum dots, if you might. But if you go to two dimensions, the edge states become lines, you know? And this is the edge states. And in three dimension, it becomes a surface, you know, and, and, and so on, right? So it's basically d minus one conduction. Okay, so uh, yeah, yeah. What is the significance of the dotted line around that bond? Uh, nothing really. You can group it this way or that way. But if you see, you know, if I'm drawing it this way, this is just a unit cell. Sorry. Okay. You, okay. Because if you yeah. go to that other slide where you uh, broke the bonds. Yeah. Yeah, meaning uh, you can. Yeah, here, because then why can't you trace it the opposite way so that they're angled the other way and then it would look. You can, uh, yeah, I say that's a good question because it's sometimes confusing. See, the dot lines is something you have drawn, right? Sure. You don't think about it initially, just look at it physically, right? Physically, uh, you know, this is clearly, uh, m you know, this, is, this situation is different from that one. Sure. Okay? So. The dotted lines are drawn to say that, uh, you know, if I'm write, going to write a Hamiltonian, this is my nth unit cell, that is n plus 1, n plus 2, and so on. That's the only reason they're drawn there. There's no other reason, really. And you can group them in any way you want, actually, you know, this way or that, yeah. Okay, so, all right. So, so the, uh, how will the Hamiltonian look for this state, then? Uh, it will be, uh, it's a very, it's actually a 1D system, right? It's a 1D system, and you can be either in site A, or inside B, right? Let's say I go to the nth, this is my nth unit cell, okay? and I say uh, if I am in site A in the nth unit cell and I hop to site B, which is the you know, uh, open circle here, I, my hopping energy is V. Okay? So how I write that? I write V and I annihilate there, right? And I create b comma n plus 1, right? that's the hopping term, right, in the Hamiltonian. And, and so th 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 that's, that's just the uh, hopping from here to there, and you can now hop from here to there as well, right? Uh, sorry, uh, this, this quantity, I should just put it as n. So the two of them, this is the dash line you ask, uh, you know, your question, this is my nth unit cell. And then if I hop from here to there, this is my term. If I hop to the left, I have W is my, you know, it's, the, it's, a, it's a different energy term. Uh, but now I have gone to, I'm hopping from again, annihilating in C A comma N, but I'm creating in B comma N minus one now, right? I'm in the other cell, right? So that's your Hamiltonian, and you sum it over all Ns. That's your Hamiltonian for this model. And this, is, uh, this was developed in 1970s for organic long chain molecules looking at electron transport through polyacetylene, which was the long chain organic conductors by, you know, Shu, Schrieffer and Heger. Uh, it's called the SSH model um, for, for uh, uh, long chain molecules. And from here, uh, again, you can go back and look at your Fourier series, you know, of this. You just go to K space. And when you convert it into K space, uh, your Hamiltonian will look uh, this is uh, also uh, asked you to look at it from the assignment uh, for the assignment. It's very much like graphene, but not quite. You know, so a b dagger k, and uh, just you know, it's so there's a k a, but you know the a you can uh, 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 just one second. Zero. Hmm. 
that's uh, so these are uh, your operators in k space now and either sum or integrate which are, yeah there's a question yeah. so just going back to the physical two the picture so it looks like your surface states which is defined as one layer from the surface has to be protected by time reversal symmetry do you have this yeah, I think I'm not talking about, uh, of course, this is, uh, you know, the time reversal symmetry aspect, I'm not invoking it at all at this point. It's not, uh, it is going to be, you know, if, uh, so there is inversion symmetry, time reversal symmetry, and, uh, you know, there's the chirality of it. I mean, there, there are three aspects of it. I'm not uh, discussing that now, but I just want to give a very intuitive picture that you can understand you can definitely map it into the picture of time reversal symmetry, you know, just it, because of we have finite time. You know, that's, right, yeah. uh, but uh, maybe you have a reason to ask it, but I don't know exactly what. So I'll, I'll just uh, go through the argument without it at this point. Okay, so, yeah. But you know, essentially, if, if, if this is the crystal, then here's your Hamiltonian. Right? And once you have your Hamiltonian, now we go there and find, well, what's the winding number? What's, what's the wrapping? How, what's the churn number? All that stuff we can ask now, right? Because you have the Hamiltonian at your disposal. Uh, when you find the eigenvalues of it, uh, you know, you, 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 you can, uh, by the way, you can see that this, for example, is an example four unit cell matrix where I have eight atoms, one, two, three. So here's one, there's two, three, four, right? If you hop from if you stay on the same side, it has a certain energy, but it's set to zero. Maybe it's three EV, but it's the same for all, so it's set to zero. But if you hop from here to there, you go V, right? Or you know, go from here to there, V. If you hop the other way, uh, you know, uh, the next side from here to there, you get W, you know? and that's the idea here. Right? The, so it's a two-band sort of matrix, except now it's flipping around, you know, V, W, V, W, flipping back, back and forth. And using that, you can find all the eigenvalues, eigenfunctions, and I'll show you a few plots of that right now. Okay. But uh, now I have the Hamiltonian, right? I can go and plot all the eigenvalues. Uh, I, I can plot the band structure of this EK diagram, right? Let's plot it. So here's the EK diagram, energy versus K. But it's plotted for various values of these two hopping terms, V and W, different strengths of hopping terms. Uh, let's look at some simple cases first. Uh, uh, what if V is equal to W? Right? If V is equal to W means both the energies are equal, so there's really no difference, and, and, and the band structure looks actually like that, and there's uh, no band gap. It's closed you know, right? when V is equal to, equal to W. Yeah? And uh, uh, what is being plotted at the bottom here is this vector here we talked about? That's being plotted in the in the bottom, and uh, here there is no z. You can see, uh, right? The diagonal terms have zeros. So uh, if there was a z term or a mass term, you'll have a, some positive number and some negative number here, right? Right? There's none of that. So so that means that term is zero. That means this vector is always going to wind in the equator. It's not going to get out of it, right? Does it make sense? And then this is the equator, and you're plotting it versus you know, dx and dy of these, these two components. And uh, uh, now let's look at a, uh, you know, physically what is going on here. Uh, if you draw the band, uh, bands of this situation here, w is equal to 0. And uh, you can, uh, you know, what does that mean? You have broken these bonds now, w. You know, all these bonds are broken. Now. You can't, you know, there's no lo lowering of energy if you hop. So, you know, it, so, so that, that, that's the idea of a W becoming zero. And in that case, what you have is two energies, you know, uh, um, and, and uh, uh, does that basically, because electrons cannot propagate along this, you know, there's really no dependence of K. It's like atomic energy, you know, there's just the finite energies of atomic orbitals. There's no band, there's no dispersion anymore, there's no velocity. What is velocity in you know, quantum states is dE by dK. It's zero everywhere. There's no propagation, right? Uh, here, uh, W is equal to zero, but uh, uh, your V is not zero. It's finite, OK? Right? And maybe you can look at it and so say the V is plus minus one, is one, right? Because the splitting is exactly plus V and minus V here. 
Does that make sense? I mean, so, so from just from here, the eigenvalues will be plus minus whatever sits here, right? So it's just plus minus v. Right? Now what I'm doing here, uh, and, and for this situation, wherever you are in k, here k space is very simple. You go minus pi to plus pi. That's all there is. Right? It's along a line, and you, this is your entire balloon zone. And I move around my entire balloon zone. My winding vector is always at this point. It's not moving at all. Right? It's just there, right? And if the winding vector is there, what does that mean? That means my energy of the two allowed states here is never going to be degenerate. It's not never going to meet. Right? It's never going to meet. Because if it were to meet, then my d vector here should go to 0. Do you see that? I mean, d vector is going to go to 0 here. Right? So that means it's not going to go to the origin. It's not going to intercept the origin. That's what it physically means. The vector is just stuck here with all k's. Now I go to a situation where I make, uh, do, not allow, uh, do not cut off the bonds here, but I allow for a v that is, you know, you know, where w is not 0. I allow for hopping. But now v is larger than w, meaning you know, this hopping energy is larger than that one. And then I look at, and then when you draw it, you will get a band like that. And you have a band dispersion, and it looks something you know, reasonable. Uh, you make it even larger, make v and w equal, you get this. You make v smaller than w, it looks like this. And you make v equal to 0 instead of w, it looks like that. Right? Now you look at these bands and you say, this is exactly, looks like that. This looks exactly like that. But actually, they're not the same. They're different. Because you can't see what's happening in the topological properties by just looking at the EK diagram. It's not visible here. Right? But that is visible if you look at the winding picture number here. Right? So in, the, in this case, the winding you know, of the vector is just here. It's not moving out. Just like in the graphene, it was always in the equator. It was not moving out till you added a mass term and then you stepped out of it. Here, the moment you make these two terms unequal, this vector will wind around like that now. And then you increase the strength, and then it will intercept the origin here. Right? And when you intercept the origin, you are guaranteed that the energies will become degenerate because the k is going. Basically, you are plotting, you are plotting this term, right? So and that just goes to zero. And that, so the moment you hit the origin, it means you have a very, you know, the very uh, uh, curvature blows up right, right there at that point. You know? So you have a non-zero integral at that point, right, right, you know, guaranteed. You know? And now if you go beyond that, again, uh, the, the, now it, has, uh, it is winding around. And uh, the, the vector is winding around here. But uh, essentially, if it, if it encircles the origin, you are guaranteed that you have a non-zero churn number. Right, right? And this is a geometrically or topologically guaranteed. You cannot, you know, if, it, if this circle encircles the origin, you have a certain churn number. If it doesn't, you have a different churn number. If it do doesn't, it's zero. If you encircle, it's one. And the churn number is actually how many times will it go around the origin? In this example, it's going around once. But you can have a different Hamiltonian. It will go around twice, in which case the churn number is two. And so on. Okay. So uh, uh, if I draw the energy band diagrams and I'll, uh, the, sorry, the energy eigenvalues, uh, uh, what is very drastically different between the two states here is if I look at these, so this is an insulator you can consider. This is also, you can call it a trivial insulator if you might, but you know, uh, there's a gap. So for both these, what you will notice is if you plot the eigenvalues of the matrix, uh, you will see that there's a gap and there's no, there are no energies in the gap. But these are different. These are, this is a topological insulator. Why? Because in the bulk band structure, it looks like an insulator. Okay? But if you actually find the Hamiltonian, for example, here's the Hamiltonian we showed you, right? And you look at all its eigenvalues for that Hamiltonian, what you'll see is something that is not visible in the EK diagram. You'll see two more states that have zero energy. You know, here zero energy, and there'll be two, or uh, there'll always be multiples of two. You know, four, six. They'll always occur in pairs. You know? And these states are zero energy, even though your you know hopping term is allowed, meaning you you can hop from one to the left or to the right. Even so, there is a zero energy state here, and these are the edge state modes. This is the state that looks at the lives at the edge. Okay? And uh, uh, here are the wave functions. Here's you know living on the left edge of this 1D crystal. You know it peaks at the left side and then kind of decays evanescently. 
and the other other energy will peak on the right side and decay evanescently. So it, and probably it's clear in the pictures here that you know this atom has a state tied to it, electrons tied to it, and the, maybe there's a finite, you know, some finite coupling at these energies, uh, at these values of hopping, and then they decays into it, and that decays into on, on from the other side. Okay. And uh, uh, so the you know churn number uh, you can you know use this formula for the churn number too if you, or you want to find the winding number, and uh, you will find that it is equal to one here, which you can see with your eyes. You don't even have to you know do the calculation. But let's say you sometimes it may be a little complicated uh, to see you know what is the total winding, and you can you use this formula to use you find the total winding of this function. Okay, and and uh, 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 okay. So so uh, what is very interesting is. If I have this bulk band structure, uh, I'm, if I've just plotted this EK diagram, there's really no way for me to tell that it is topological insulator or it's a normal insulator. There's no way for me to tell that, right? Till I do this, uh, you know, winding number picture, right? and that's that's very important. You know? And and, and uh, 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 so so, let me just. Uh, I think uh, we are uh, running up against uh, almost uh, an hour, more than an hour now, but. Uh, uh, so uh, I'll just kind of try to end it here, this discussion, by showing you a few things about the. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, um, the right. So so this is again just a simulation of what I told you. You know, V and W uh, are the hopping terms, and you can close the gap when V and W become equal, right? And uh, and you can kind of now go back and change this, except you can't say now what happened, whether they're the same or the different, because the band structures look exactly different. But clearly, things have changed now. The U and V have changed uh, their uh, you know signs. But uh, you know, here's the picture of the eigenvalue spectrum or the EK diagram and the winding number picture here. Okay. So if you look at you know the uh, you know as I start moving, you can see the circle. Of the winding, you know, the tip of the vector here. If it doesn't go through the origin, which is zero zero, then you have a normal insulator, and you don't hit it till here. And then uh, once I switch it, you'll see that the circle goes and encircles the origin, and then you have a topological insulator. Now, yeah. Yes. If you have a, a non-zero churn number, you will have edge states, and uh, uh, and you you have an opportunity to see quantum hall sort of behavior or things like that. So, uh, so, so uh, again, here we are dealing with these v values, and, and it says so. One way to go from a situation where you have All right, so the, the last thing is, uh, if, if, if I actually take this and I uh, say that, can I do something like what I did for graphene? <coughs> um, meaning, can I, can I uh, uh, for example, when, when I have V is equal to this value here, right? Uh, then then the, uh, the, the tip of the vector winds around the origin. And once, for example, as I move around the k-space uh, from minus pi to pi, it winds around once. So the ch you know winding number is actually uh, one for this. Uh, but uh, if I uh, and and this is uh, uh, this is a one D topological insulator. It has edge states. Uh, and and uh, wh what if I want to change this from? Uh, can I go from a topological insulator phase to a normal phase or an insulator phase by uh, what sort of a transition? Because you are not going to physically add or physically clip these bonds or something like that, right? You're going to kind of externally do it in some other ways. So you can ask a question of is there sort of a phase diagram you can develop for this? And uh, okay, he is things. So for all values of these two bond, you know, hopping energies. Uh, one side of it, one one side of it is a standard insulator. There are no edge states, no. and the other side of it are topological insulator where you are guaranteed to have these edge states. And you can go from here to here, and you will always be topologically the same. You know, it will have the same number of edge states. No. But if you go from here to here, this is a transition. 
from one state of matter to another, one state of matter as characterized by the topological index or as characterized by the transport properties and all that sort of thing. <coughs> so this will have a finite, you know, the, uh, the 2D analog or the 3D analog because in a 0D edge state there is no transport. Right? It's just, uh, but the 1D analog will have e squared by h times an integer, you know, and, in, 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 uh, and you go to higher dimensions. So essentially what I'm trying to say is if you, as long as you are in one side of it, it you are guaranteed to have these edge states, and these have been born not out of magnetic fields, but by the way you've designed the crystal now, your Vs and Ws, and the lattice sites and all that sort of thing. This is in bulk. Sorry? This is in bulk, right? So this is the phase of everything included. You know, it's the bulk plus the edge states, all of them included. This is meaning you're asking this phase diagram? Yeah, it's, yeah. De it's describing everything collectively. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And the bulk and the edge states are deeply connected here, right? Uh, because uh, if I go back, uh, you know, we ask what is different between, you see this is bulk and this is also bulk. These are the bulk band structures. But they're topologically different, you know. So in other words, this bulk is different from that bulk. How, right? How is it different? Because it has edge states and this one doesn't have edge states, you know. So that's the difference between the two bulk states now. You know? Does it make sense? I mean, so the ba bulk band structure is like that here, and it's like that here. It's exactly the same, except the edge states, which are not being drawn here, because there are zero D states. There is no, you know, there's no K involved with it, so you don't draw it in this picture. So that's why it's not showing up here. And so, yeah. I think I might be missing the picture. I think I understand why you can have a transition between topological and trivial insulator, but I'm not sure as to why this picture V has to be. Uh, greater than w for so V and W here are uh, you know parameters. You know, d uh, meaning, it's just saying that if I were able to create a crystal such that my hopping terms are different between if it goes to the left or to the right. So I've broken some sort of a translation symmetry here, right? Inversion symmetry. You can see that, right? then I'm guaranteed to have this behavior. That's all it's saying. Okay. No, the strength of all that is somewhat irrelevant at this point, right? But what is most important is it's <coughs> not the same if you go this way or that way, and then you're guaranteed that. So yeah, yeah. So if I'm understanding this correctly, if you took, uh, let's call that essentially a polyacetylene chain. Yes. If you took a mirror image of that, um, so, a vertic so a vertical mirror image flipped it around, uh, this picture would look opposite. So like it would be if your W is uh, or weaker than your V term, yeah. you'd start having a topological insulator instead of what it is now, which is it's a topological insulator if your V is weaker than your W term. Because it's, it's the, the fact that the geometry is the problem is that these are the pairs that you have line up perfectly when they're going this way, but not when you're going this way. Is that it? Or this one second. Just one second, yeah. <laughs> uh, I see. So what you're asking is uh, uh, what is different between, in, for example, here, if V and W are, uh, you know, because you, you can take this to be an infinite chain, uh, but, uh, well, then, then, then you'd only get the bulk properties, right? Mm -hmm. So here we are ending in a V, and here we are ending you know, in the same, right? Or if you wrap them into a circle, you also only get the, if you like, wrap it into a ring. Yeah, that's a good point. If I wrap it around, I have no edge anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So I will never get this you know, if I wrap it around completely. Does that make sense? I mean, there's no edge left, so you can't get an edge state. They have to have a finite surface state, a, a b finite surface to get these edge states. Similarly, in a 2D material, I must have finite edges. You know, I can't have a full torus physically because then there is no, no point where the ca states can be localized. So there's no edge, you know. So um, I, I think, uh, let me try to understand your question. So you're saying that if I, you know, there's mirror inversion, th there is clearly broken inversion symmetry, in, you know, mirror inversion symmetry here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's, that's, I was not trying to get into time reversal or mirror inversion, but Yes, that's what is responsible for this situation here. Okay. I'm also yeah. thinking that if you introduce a white uh, atom on the left and uh, a gray on the right, yeah. right, then you might probably have the opposite condition, right? That no, yeah, yeah. should be greater than W or... 
So remember, if, if these things change space, the physics has never changed at all. You're still guaranteed to have two edge, edge states. You know, what, how we plotted it is going to be different, and that's all there is to it, right? You know, that, is that what you mean? So you can add one more here and one more here. This physics is not going to change. You know? yeah. But what, you, what will be very important here is if you, here what we have done is plotted W is equal to 1, okay, full strength of that, and we are changing V from, you know, broken bonds, okay, yeah. to, you know, broken bonds to something which has finite, you know, conduct, right? And you see there are zero states here. If you do the other way around here, meaning if you put V is equal to 1 and W, you will not, you, you, this will yeah. split. Yeah, what if you just split, have yeah. one atom on the right? And you might still, I mean, no matter what configuration, you'll always have its place. I mean, no, no matter how you terminate it, because right now you're term, terminating with like a gray atom on the left and white on the right, right? So let's say you had one gray on the right, right? Would you still have its states? So a crystal uh, should have, uh, let's see, the same number of the two, you know, if, if you were, if unit cell must repeat, okay. right? So you can't, uh, right, right, uh, maybe I think a little more of what you're saying, but uh, it must have a, you know, uh, integer number of the unit cell. And, and if, if so, uh, you can only break it in this way or that way. There's no other option, really, at all, right? And you can kind of twist around and say that I can add one more, one more here, but you'll always get this, right? And when you break it, this is that normal insulator state where you don't get this picture, where you will, it will split completely, right? There's no, no topological edge state here. Whereas in this situation, you are guaranteed to, to have these edge states with zero mode energies. You know? and, so, and this is mathematically guaranteed for this problem. And uh, its 2D analog is the, uh, you know, the, the uh, one that Charlie Kane and Meli and others they predicted quantum spin hall effect based on this idea. Exactly the same idea, except you just go to two dimensions now for graphene. And then the way, the way they did that is, uh, you know, from Haldane, he said, I'm going to flip this. Now they added the spin variable here and said that the spin variable is plus here and minus here, for example. That's another thing, another mass term, for example. Just like you add the, you know, uh, uh, so, so that, 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 that graduates from the, you know, the localized states at the two ends of a 1D structure to, uh, you know, in a, in a 2D strip, for example, it becomes the edge states. And uh, because it's tied to the spin, now what happens is if it's going to the right, it, may, it, will, it can only have off spin. And if it's going to the, you know, uh, well, let's say, and if it's going this way, on the other side, it has, uh, the up spin, if it is going, the, essentially the momentum and spin get locked again because of this, this property. It has a valley asymmetry as well. Yeah. If each atom had a coordination number four, you would introduce two more parameters. Yes. And your, um, like how, how would you divide up the trivial and topological states? And also phase uh, diagram. Yeah, there is only one thing you need to do. Go and find this one. And this will tell you no matter whether you're in two dimensions, three dimensions, tetrahedrally bonded, hexagonally bonded, it doesn't matter, right? Because you see, all you are doing is you are hopping to more sites. That's all, right? And your Ks can be Kx or Kx, Ky, Kz. It doesn't matter, right? All you, you are always going to be able to write it, the Hamiltonian, in this form. You know? That's guaranteed. You know? And then you go and find this and say, am I trivial? Am I, you know, I have a churn number. Am I winding around my k space in, in, you know, uh, in a non-trivial way? And then you can see whether it is a normal insulator or not, you know, whether it has edge states or not. What I'm trying to get to is whenever I have a non-zero churn number, you are guaranteed edge states now. You know. Edge states will exist. And, uh, uh, and, and, and the churn number being non-zero in this structure came about because of uh, you know the sublattice symmetry bre breaking, you know A and B are different, hopping to the two sides are different in one D, and uh, in one state you get these edge modes, which are zero modes, zero state energy modes here. And uh, if you look at its eigenvalues, okay, this is a bulk state eigenvalue. I'm just plotting it. It just peaks in somewhere in the middle, or you know something like that. It doesn't change much. Did I even run that? Okay, no, yet. Hold on. So. So I'm plotting the uh, eigenfunction, you know, of that, and, and this is a state which is uh, a bulk state, you know, one of the k's that you have, have from the, 
uh, maybe this energy, you know. Okay, uh, but if I plot these energies at the zero modes, uh, they they will. Did I even plot that? Okay, uh, they they basically peak at the ends. You know, this one peaks here and that one peaks here. You know, the two ends and they just peak at the edges. This is an extreme case. I think if I change my v, it will kind of change a little bit, and there'll be two edge states. That's what I'm trying to say. You know, it's dominated at the edges, and the states because of the crystal hopping terms, the lattice symmetries, just these states are pushed out to the edge. You know. Just like the magnetic field pushes it out in a real, real uh, quantum hall effect. <coughs> Here it's the crystal or the spin you know, or something like that that's pushing those states out. The wave functions in real space are at the edges of the crystal. So, yeah. so uh, OK, anyway, I, I'm, I'm probably uh, don't want to go uh, much <laughs> taking up the entire time of the class today. Uh, so, you are going to uh, please read this. I mean, this is, uh, I, I think, a very well written chapter in that book, and you are solving, you know, you're, you're generating these plots for your assignment. So, you know, you should be able to play around and make these plots as well. And I think it captures pretty much all the ideas of the topological insulator. Uh, and the central concept I want to re emphasize is related to how, what's the geometric properties or the churn number of this vector, you know. And uh, sometimes, I think they might see the, uh, it's called the Pontry engine index. All kinds of mathematicians are involved with it, uh, related to the gauss bonnet theorem in some ways, and all that. You know, and and, uh, and and this is kind of something interesting and new in in, in material science and in electronics and physics. Right? So that's good. Uh, okay. So uh, uh, you know, based on the prediction of the quantum spin Hulls insulator by Charlie Kane, based on these, uh, this was uh, realized experimentally. Here's the measurement measured. Uh, you know, conductance of a material which is Mercat telluride, with you know, where the uh, there is no external magnetic field at all. B field is zero, but the conductance is e squared by h times an integer, right? And uh, this is c considered to be one of the first demonstrations of the uh, quantum spin all effect. Uh, I think this is still an evolving field because this came out, I forget, 2007 or 8, you know, uh, about uh, 10 years ago. But a lot of you know continuation of work. It happened at low temperatures and all that. But uh, hopefully, uh, you know something of this sort can appear at room temperature, for example. And uh, uh, the last thing I this is really the last slide uh, is uh, you can extend it to three dimensions. And in three dimensions, something very interesting starts happening. Uh, these are called uh, wild uh, wild semi-metals. Uh, again, uh, this is even newer than the topological insulator, but it's the same family. It's exactly the same family. Here, uh, you have uh, now. If you think about it in three dimensions, you have three-dimensional case space k x k y k z. And uh, what happens now is uh, so the while uh, semi-metal. If you look at the Hamiltonian, it actually has, uh, in addition to all these, you know. Uh, uh, so the wave function also gets something called a chirality. You know, I'll just end it with some uh, notation of chirality. It's just like the polarization of light. You know, if an electron is going that way, it is the wave function is you know rotating in this direction. For example, this is chirality. It is not spin. You know, it's just the chirality of the wave function. It's just like polarization of electromagnetic wave. You know. And uh, while semi-metal actually has chirality of electrons, and that's very interesting because what happens? Well, others too, but here what happens is. It has a Dirac cone points where these degenerate, and they always occur in pairs. One has, you know, a, maybe a positive churn number; the other is negative. For example, okay, yeah. Does the chirality relate to the orbital angle of momentum? You can. Uh, uh, you can that's where it comes from. Okay. That's where it comes from here. You know, as an example, you can think of the orbit is such that you know the crystal orbit is such that it is imparting it that chirality. You know. Because a free electron in space is, doesn't have this chirality. It is only in a crystal that you engineer this sort of mo motion of it. Okay? And, and so if you have that, though, what is very interesting in the wild semi-metal is uh, uh, physically uh, it will, you know, let's say an electron, this is k-space, but let's say in real space, in real space, the electron is moving towards the surface, and it has a chirality like that. Now, uh, the chirality gets tied to the direction of k. You know, if it's going this way, it can go like that. If it's going that way, it must spin, you know, its chirality is opposite, which means if it hits the surface, 
it cannot reflect because the surface has no way for it to impart it a change in chirality. You know? So that's what will happen in a while saying, well, here's the surface. And now the only way it can do uh, go now is it actually has to go on the surface. It cannot really reflect back you know, in a while saying metal. And, and because the wave function kind of decays into the crystal, whereas on the surface it will go and there's a, it will physically uh, you know, go a, across an arc in the case space. And this is called the Fermi arc of the, on the surface state. You know, it'll kind of, so physically in real space, the electron will kind of spin around and then meet another state which is going in with opposite chirality in the opposite k direction. And so physically, the electron is going to kind of go around, come down, go around, come down, and it will do this sort of behavior. Now that's very interesting. This was predicted in 2011, 2012, and people are trying very hard to measure it now. But uh, this is one of the newest things in topological <coughs> insulators. And uh, it, of course, requires very special crystalline symmetries, the choice of atoms, and all that business. But uh, uh, experimentally, this has been observed in RPS measurements, where you're doing e you know, measurement of EK diagrams. But transport effects have not been measured yet in this. You know, so it's still an open area. Uh, but uh, essentially, the Hamiltonian of Weyl semi-metals is very similar to this Hamiltonian, except uh, it's, it's, it's a, uh, I think you can get by by 2 by 2, but it's actually a 4 by 4. You know, because Dirac's Hamil original Hamiltonian is a 4 by 4 Hamiltonian. And, and, uh, but it has the same sort of structure. You look for winding numbers and all that business. And in the end, the physical manifestation is, is something like this. You know? And uh, so, and, and such materials can exist. And uh, if, if it is possible theoretically, I think it should be possible experimentally. Uh, and and uh, people are trying to design, grow these crystals and measure them as well at, at this point in time. Yeah. Um, just backtracking. Yeah. To the picture of like, yeah, measuring the Turing number. Uh, yeah, of measuring the Turing number. How do you do that experimentally? Because you can't. Uh, I imagine like you could use angle result XPS to get band structure, but that won't tell you anything about, as you indicated, um, it won't tell you anything about um, the churn number, like in the case of um, in the case of that polymer chain. Oh, yeah, so polymer chain, uh, so uh, from the perspective of this class, I would say the most strongest ex you know, proof of churn number measurement is the transport and the conductance quantization. Whatever sits in front of E squared by H is, is a churn <laughs> number. Okay. Except uh, transport requires a very high quality of the crystal. You know, I mean, basically, if you have a lot of Right, it's very sensitive to many, many things. You know, uh, it's sensi rather transport is sensitive to everything. You know, uh, RPS can be a little more forgi for forgiving where you measure the EK diagram, but transport is not forgiving at all. It's it measures, you know, every quantum property of the material is uh, is sampled by the electron as it moves. Right, so uh, experimentally, uh, for example, uh, I showed you a few examples of uh, you know, it, uh, as an example, quantum Hall is a direct measurement of churn number. Right. The integer quantum model is direct measurement. It's it is very precisely quantized. You're measuring the churn number there. Uh, this is a quantum spin hall, which is a measurement of the churn number again, right? Right. <coughs> um, now, now, if you uh, look at a polyacetylene, if you are doing STM measurements and you are imaging the wave function squared, I showed you an image of calculation of the wave functions. If you see that, well, for whatever reason, I have these edge states, right? And they have zero energy, whereas I'm, I'm looking at my bulk states, I'm tunneling into these states, I have zero energy, tunneling into those states, I have those energies. Do you know what I mean? Then you can say, well, that, it must have a churn number now, right? So, so there are all kinds of measurements you can use to, you can do the energy in a picture, or you can, because in STM, you're doing spatially resolved ST, you know, measurement. Right? This you will miss if you're just doing the bulk. If you're doing the bulk, you will get a you know energy separation and you think oh it's an insulator but you can't say whether it's a ordinary insulator or a topological so for that you have to go to the edge and find out what happened right? transport already gives you that yeah so, yeah Sorry. <laughs> no problem yeah so think about it if you have question yeah Right, so uh, actually uh, the, uh, what is very f 
kind of uh, remarkable about these things is uh, uh, back in 1937, you know, Cornelius Herring was a well-known, you know, physicist. He uh, had shown that if you have any 3D material, uh, you know, and you are able to write a two-band Hamiltonian like that, you can do that for any, you know, any dimensions, as I mentioned, right? And uh, you know, whenever this goes to zero, you have degeneracies of bands, right? The bands touch, right? So, so, uh, and let's say touch is like that. That's the point where h of k is zero because that's the, you know, the difference here is two times absolute value of h, right? So, so that's a degeneracy. And uh, uh, typically in a crystal, <coughs> these degeneracies are avoided because there's level repulsion in quantum mechanics. Any sort of, even the smallest term that couples these two states, okay, psi one, and any sort of perturbation term that couples the two will lead to our energy which will, you know, if I have two states here, it will split uh, by the perturbation. And this is called avoided level crossing, and that's why we actually get band gaps and all that in the first place. Right? But it is possible in some crystals that you will have, uh, big, you know, every possible symmetry breaking you can, every possible situation you can create will still give you a zero term here. You know, so with that herring, you know, Cornelius Herring had identified a long time ago, 1937. But those crystals were never realized. Why? Because what does that mean? It means that. In every crystal, silicon, for example, you have these things as well. You know, you, you, you look at silicon band structure, you'll see, you know, somewhere in the K space, there will be, a, you know, avoided level crossing like that. Okay, every crystal, you know, uh, you, you're kind of um, uh, going to have those, and if you look at band diagram, you'll see it. You know, there are crossings here, except, you know, those things are, if they occur very far from where the Fermi level is, when all the electrons are, you know, there's no action. There is nothing to really see, right? So only in some crystals, you have enough electrons that you fill it up and you are at that point now. Right? That's, those are the wild semi-metals where you can actually see uh, things with transport and all that. Right? And, and these days, I mean, people have, by counting electrons and all that, you identified a few, uh, I forget, cadmium-3, arsenic-2, sodium-3, bismuth, all kinds of, I mean, there is a whole list of things people are doing. I think maybe Philip has a better list of things here but anyway yeah there is a list of things and uh, <coughs> uh, a list of these elements basically you want enough electrons to fill up all, all up to this point you know? and the Fermi levels Fermi energy should be close to that point then you see transport effects if you are you know, out here you don't see it so uh, so in other words uh, doesn't have to be, uh, basically you have to kind of match two things. You, you must have a while crossing at a at some energy and, and your electro, it, it must be around the Fermi energy of the system, you know. So that, and that limits the combinations of elements you can create it with, for example, yeah. What's the difference between the winding of the yeah, so uh, actually the winding number I, I keep hearing is not the right terminology exactly, but uh, the physical fact that the vector is wrapping around the surface, okay, that is uh, the churn number. How many times it wraps around the entire surface is exactly the churn number. You know? uh, and and uh, it's sometimes called the index of, uh, uh, anyway, these are just names, but physically, you know, the integer that occurs is, is exactly how many times this h vector, you know, if it, you are painting the surface with it, how many, how many coats have you applied, you know, over the entire surface. If you have missed any, uh, then you don't have an integer churn number. Of course, you can have, I, I already talked that I can have a half uh, surface, you know, uh, and that is when you don't get, you know, that, that's when you're, uh, you have a finite, you know, uh, integral of this very curvature. That's what, in your assignment problem, you have the anomalous Hall effect. You know, that you explain with that picture. You know. The quantize, whenever you have quantization, it must be wrapping around an integer number of times, you know. That's where you get the integer. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I, um, you know, my main uh, suggestion for the last time is kind of pay attention to this idea. You know, this, this is where the heart of the problem is. And everything you can kind of map it to this problem and then sketch these and uh, you know, kind of take it from there because 
and it comes in many guises. You know, you can talk about time reversal symmetry, inversion symmetry, chirality, parity, all that stuff. But they're all buried here, and you can. To me, it's a little easier to go from here to the and understand what is inversion symmetry, what is all that stuff, than than well, how does that in, influence this? Than to kind of start from there, and and look at you know how would I build it? You know, to me. Yeah. But uh, that's that's the game with the topological matter, and uh, it's uh, kind of an evolving subject, as I mentioned many times now. Uh, and now there's a whole, uh, you know, goal of people trying to classify uh, electronic properties of materials based on. You know, this is the simplest phase diagram between, you know, a trivial insulator, if you might, and a topological insulator. But then you can have different churn classes. This has a churn number of one. You can have a churn number of two. Can have all these, and so so now people are trying to develop what's called a periodic table for these materials, you know, because there are different classes of materials <coughs> with different transport properties, quantum transport properties, uh, but they are all topologically connected to each other, so they form one family. There's another family, so it's kind of a notion of a periodic table of these. So there are people trying to develop that stuff right now. So yeah. So luckily, most of the stuff uh, that we talked about in the earlier part of the course, like silicon, gallium nitride, they are all. <laughs> this family, you know, and this is uh, uh, already very, very useful, as you know, right? So, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, this may be useful this, sure. Why are, um, what are the applications of topological What are the applications? So, uh, I'll answer it in two phases. One, the first phase of my <laughs> the application is uh, that uh, it really advances our understanding of what is possible, you know. In some, in, in terms of uh, electronic properties of materials, that's more of a fundamental answer, right? The immediate applications, as uh, is being shown now, is uh, at room temperature, uh, you can apply spin orbit torque on a magnet, and so Professor Ralph's group here, Dan Ralph's group, they are using topological insulators to, you know, for nanoscale magnets that are used in memories, high, very high density, infinite endurance memories which consume very little power and they stay, remember things indefinitely. This is a magnet. You know? But then you want to switch it. Typically, it takes a lot of energy to switch a magnet. You know? But inter because of internal you know, spin momentum locking of topological insulators, the, you know, the very nature of the crystal itself, because you have put in a lot of spin orbit coupling and all that, and you have created a topological insulator <coughs> that already has quite a bit of kind of effectively built-in magnetic field according to our an, all analysis now. So as a result, you need much lower you know, energy to switch a magnet because it's already kind of sitting on the threshold at, at some point. So they're able to see that uh, these materials at room temperature can interact and control magnetism in, you know, in, in, in uh, ways that were not possible before. So that's one first sort of first uh, pass application of this, I would say, from a transport perspective. Obviously, there are a lot of other possibilities one can imagine, you know, inductors, you know, because if you have current flowing around a loop, that's a nice inductor. Typically, you cannot scale an inductor to very small sizes, but if it's, in, you know, uh, no matter what shape you make, it's always going to go around the edge, right? This is great, right? Because you don't have to geometrically make a loop anymore. It, it's just going to kind of do that. There are many things like that one can imagine. Uh, but I would really say that one of the big challenges in this field is, uh, you know, when we say that the bulk has the bar has a gap, it's insulating, and then the edges have these edge states. You know, the bulk gaps typically are very small in these materials. So at room temperature, you start thermally kind of washing out everything because the gap is so small that you thermally ha excite electrons from the lower to the upper energy level. And so you don't have that sort of protection uh, to be able to see the topological edge states because that's washed out by the bulk properties. You know? So there's a lot of challenge now to try to make topological insulators that in which the bulk gap is large enough so that you can really see the edge states nicely. You know what I mean? The gap, if this is you know, a KT, then at room temperature you'll have occupied all of this and you'll have more states here almost than here, kind of. You know? Because there are a lot more density of states here. There's only two here. Right? So, so any signal I measure will be swamped out by this signal you know, than here. So that's kind of a big challenge with topological insulators today. Yeah. Can you possibly Absolutely, yeah, and that's something that also people are starting to think about. So, can you break 
some lattice symmetries or interlayer symmetries. So instead of one layer, what if I had two layers, and then I apply vertical electric field, so one layer sees a different potential than the other. So now what happens then? Can I get you know, these properties because of an external field? Can I move between one phase to another with field effect? That's a gold mine for, I think, if people figure it out how. Because field effect is really, you know, drives every billion transistors in your microprocessor today. And uh, it's an electric field, so if you can go between topological phases with electric field, that would be very interesting as well. <coughs> okay, good. I think there's no time left at all for review, uh, which is, uh, I guess, uh, probably okay. You have a lot of videos also if you want to review materials. I would love to kind of make a little connection to all the stuff we have talked about because uh, one of the other things kind of answering your question earlier is if you take, a, you can kind of push it to the <laughs> other end now, you can take a topological insulator uh, and you can put a superconductor next to it. You know, And now your superconductor has, you know, spin paired electrons, right, uh, up and down spin. You try to inject it into a topological insulator. Now there are some very special states. For example, if I inject into this state here, as an example, don't consider it to be a you know accurate statement. But if I have these zero energy modes, and uh, if it has many modes available to it, you know, and in a, in a two D material, for example, it will only enter in the zero energy modes because otherwise it cannot satisfy all the spin and momentum and everything included. So these are called zero energy modes or called the Majorana fermions. It's the same thing. You know, if you take a Cooper pair and you inject it into a topological insulator, zero energy mode, that's a Majorana fermion state, for example. And, and that's a very interesting sort of transport because uh, they have, uh, if you take a Majorana fermion and you kind of move it around the other Majorana fermion, once it will have a phase. If you go the other way around, it will have a different phase. So you can kind of braid them now and then you can create this what's called topologically protected computation and all that. These are you know, kind of thought about by people, you know, they're conceived by people. But you know, again, uh, it, it will need a little while to realize all that stuff, but it's possible, you know, definitely possible. And then those are interesting things to look at in the future. Okay, so, so that's, that's all. I think we can stop. Uh, we are already uh, uh, two hours into the class. And uh, um, I generally, uh, for a grad course, I, it's almost like 2001 Space Odyssey. We end at a point where everything is uncertain, right? But I think it's good because I wanted to expose you to things that are, you know, uh, uh, the state of the art and where, where, are, where the thing is. And hopefully you're able to digest because there's so much stuff that we covered in the class. Uh, I had to leave out a few things as well. But uh, on the whole, uh, uh, I hope you are able to find some of these topics useful for your future. And you know, if, if they're exciting, um, many of them are really hot topics of research now. And some of them, at least, are bound to have some useful applications in the future that we talked about towards the very end of the course. Yeah, you know, superconductors, semiconductors have already been, been very, very useful. You know, so. so in superconductors, hopefully we find room temperature superconductivity. Of course, that's the big, big challenge. And in topological insulators, it's uh, you know already finding some use, and I think that will increase. And semiconductors have gotten, you know, uh, faster, smaller, better in every aspect, and they continue to. You know, band gaps are getting bigger and. You can get UV emission, you know, larger and larger photon energies. Uh, so there's a lot to do still. Uh, and I think if you read the article, it's a good way to end this course. Uh, if you read the article on uh, the Berry Phase review article, the last sentence is a take on, uh, you know, Feynman's uh, statement on nanotechnology that there's plenty of room at the bottom. And uh, what uh, this article says is there's a plenty of room in the momentum space, you know, which is, you know, I think you can see why, you know, but uh, it's actually true that, you know, all these things were laying hidden under the nose of people who had discovered quantum and solid state, but never <laughs> really found out. So that's, yeah, that's the nature of science, and I think it's always fun to see how it has evolved. Yeah. What courses do you recommend would be good as like, a continuation of at least some of the topics that were covered? Like, this course? So, yeah, uh, if if you are uh, um, interested, for example, in superconductivity, there's a very nice course on correlated electron properties in physics uh, that's taught by, uh, I think, Seamus Davis and Katya Novak taught it last time. You know, that's a very good course where it goes into that, those angles. 
Uh, I think Professor Dan Ralph teaches a solid state physics course where he focuses also a bit on the spin aspect of story and spin transport and spin Hall effect and spin orbit orbitrox, right? Uh, is that going on this semester? Yeah. Did he talk about those things? So that's another course where these topics would be covered. I'm thinking more along the transport you know, uh, part of the story. And uh, 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 what other courses maybe you guys know in... Um, uh, if you want to learn some things that I left out, you know, like uh, there's a mathematical techniques rather than physical, you know, phenomena, uh, like Green's functions and how do you use them for transport. There are very nice online lectures too from the Purdue Nano Hub site by, you know, Professor Supriyo Dutta's uh, lectures are very nice. There's a good book. Uh, I would say that uh, that that uh, that's also kind of a thing we had we had done last time, but I, this time I chose to focus a little bit more on other things. Uh, because that was a bit more on the technique side rather than physical, you know, sort of thing. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, those are the things I would mention. Uh, probably I'm missing out quite a few others, uh, but as far as transport related courses, th those are the ones which are related to this, what we talked about, yeah. Okay. Okay, let's end it here. I think we are uh, um, in, uh, done enough. So, yeah, all right, good. Thank you, guys. And, there's some...